So I guess first up, um, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Fiona, for those that don't know me, and I'm the Sustainability Officer on campus. Um, and this is the very last in our event programme for Green Week. So we hope that you got to see some of the, the stuff we put out this week and indeed got to um, come to some of our events and we hope you enjoyed it. I have to probably acknowledge at this point the work of the Green Campus Committee. They've been phenomenal and in particular Declan here um, who was running a lot of it behind the scenes and um, in the fore as well. He was chairing some of the sessions. So um, uh, he's done a phenomenal amount of work. So thanks Declan. Um, and I guess as one door closes, another opens because this is the launch of our sustainability series. And the idea was Green Campus, we thought that it would be really nice to get staff together um, in a kind of a relaxed setting that we could just chat openly and creatively about sustainability, about what it means to us, and I guess the role we can all play. Um, and in addition to that, then we thought that it's a nice opportunity to spotlight some of the sustainability work and expertise that's going on around campus and that we have available to us. So on that note, I guess if anyone has any ideas for some of the future sessions in this series, and if you'd like to get involved, we'd love to hear from you. So please just just drop me or Declan an email. Um, and just to, to chat a little bit about the format for today, um, it's we're going to start off with a very short kind of panel discussion. And um, then we're going to open up to Q&A and um, hopefully get lots of your questions and your comments about um, futures thinking and IT Sligo at 100 and of course sustainability. Um, and just to let you know that we're actually going to record this session. So I hope that's OK with everybody. We have lofty notions that it might be of interest to people um, as a podcast. So we'll see how that works out. But the idea is that it would make this sustainability series collection more accessible to everybody. We all know that we're at our desks so much these days. It's nice to be able to listen to something like this and catch it when you're out and about. So today's event is um, Futures Thinking and Sustainability. And um, I guess for me anyway, these two themes go hand in hand because Futures Thinking uses methods of reflection to help us kind of imagine what the world might look like at a certain point in the future. And then, of course, sustainability, the very essence of sustainability came about um, from a real concern about what kind of future world we're handing over to our children and our grandchildren. Um, so to discuss this, I'm delighted to introduce you to our panel for today. We have with us Therese Hume. Therese has been lecturing here in the Department of Computing and Ele Electronic Engineering since 1996. Her research interests include socio-technical change, in particular sustainability transitions and the role of higher education institutions as spaces for learning for a sustainable future. And with Mary McGuckin, Mary has been lecturing here in IT Sligo in strategy and tourism for over 20 years. And she teaches scenario planning and futures as part of her modules in the business and accounting degree programmes. And she's also currently a member of Fall to Ireland Destination Working Group and the Task Force for Sligo. And we're also joined by John Pender. John is a senior lecturer in social policy, politics and future studies. He's currently joint coordinator of Prospero, pedagogy of robotics in the social professions in Europe and is co-supervising postgraduate research into the preparedness of regional, environmental and agricultural sectors for a future of significant climate change disruption. So a couple of years ago now, John, Theresa, Mary all got together and they conducted um, a really interesting piece of research portraying different scenarios describing how IT Sligo and our wider, wider region might look like in 2070 for IT Sligo's 100th birthday. Um, so John, I think if I'd like to start with you, if you'd like to read an extract maybe from your research about a future scenario. Yes, um, thank you for the introduction Fiona and thank you to everybody participating today. So just to give this some sort of context, uh, myself, Mary and Therese uh, had one of those impromptu, uh, really enriching conversations in O'Hare's. Do you remember O'Hare's? Um, in fact, it's very auspicious. Today is the anniversary. Today we were all kicked out of our wonderful surroundings at the IT. Mm -hmm. but there you go. Um, and little did we know we'd be out for a year. Um, and we should admit from the very outset that our research um, anticipating IT Sligo at 100 uh, didn't actually identify um, that the pandemic or a pandemic would have a huge impact on our lives. So we have to put our hands up and admit that flaw. But anyway, um, we got chatting and we realised from our own multidisciplinary perspectives that we had a shared interest in forecasting, foresight and the futures. And we decided we would contribute a chapter to the textbook on IT Slide with 50. So, um, yeah, 
we have various research methodologies, which we can talk about um, at the end of the session. If people want to know more about them, but broadly they were uh, derived from our actual, um, I suppose, output research findings from workshops, uh, from focus groups, uh, surveys, and uh, conversations with colleagues and students. So here's the first, um, the first scenario, and we produced a number of scenarios in our document that I'm going to read to you. And it's about conjuring up images of a future and imagining sort of context within which life and society and education and all manner of things would, would operate um, 50 years from now. So here we go. NetEarn has just released data on last month's weather. The highest mean wind speed ever recorded in the European Union occurred on Monday the 17th of May 2069 at Ross's Point, where the wind speedometer hit 200 kilometers per hour. Monthly rain averages have continued to exceed 1,000 millimetres during the spring. In times past, these extreme meteorological occurrences would surely have spelled catastrophe for our region. However, foresight specialists at the Atlantic Technological University in 2023, drawing upon overwhelming biodiversity and climate change data, institutionalised a 30-year strategic plan premised on a commitment to regional communities preparedness for a tumultuous future. Central to this vision was the development of transdisciplinary provision of programs that sought to enable communities, individuals and businesses to develop creative solu solutions um, and thus migrate away from consumption patterns that were no longer environmentally or ethically sustainable. Thanks for that, that John. It's um, quite a hostile climate there you described in, in the introduction, but I guess it's not that hard for us to imagine it today, given the, the stormy weather outside. And some really interesting themes coming through there, um, particularly around the leadership role the Institute plays and that idea of building resilience at a community level. Um, and of course, that, that emphasis on interdisciplinarity, um, which is obviously key to sustainability. Um, Mary, maybe I can bring you in at this point, um, because you obviously lecture in business. How does futures thinking fit then in the business world and maybe in your teaching? OK, thank you very much, Fiona. And hi, everyone. Um, I think Mags must have jinxed me just before uh, the, this started because my broadband just went down. <laughs> I had a panic attack there for about two minutes. So uh, thankfully, it's up and running again, and hopefully it, it, there won't be any more interruptions. So if I can just explain, I've been lecturing in, in strategy. I deliver two modules to all the final year, not all of them, but quite a lot of the business and accounting final year students. And I've been doing that for quite, you know, quite a long period of time. But one of the frameworks that we use um, is scenario planning. That we, we use a lot of different planning and analytical frameworks uh, through strategy, through both strategy modules. But the one I suppose that's of interest today is the area of scenario planning, otherwise known as futures. And I suppose what makes it very different to all of the other, well, most of the other modules or the other frameworks, I should say, that we use yeah. is that it's based on foresight. Whereas a lot of the other mo other frameworks that are being used in strategy and business planning generally are often more based on hindsight. In other words, we look back at past performance or we look at historical data. So that's what really makes, I suppose, futures as we know it very interesting. And it, I suppose, allows for great creativity um, in a classroom setting, but also in industry. I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, and it's also it's very insightful, it's very creative and it's very imaginative. Um, and it, I suppose it, it really it forces us to envis envis envision multiple futures. And I think that's what makes it interesting. Um, it also encourages us to consider the future as something we can shape or create. So it actually requires action. So it's quite you know, it's very, it's quite a robust framework, even though it is, you know, it is quite, you know, using your imagination or creativity. It's, it's, it's just a different approach and it's very interesting. So why we use futures, I'm thinking, again, from a classroom setting with the classes uh, from an academic perspective, but also from an industry perspective, I'll come back to in just a moment. There's some of the reasons why, well, I've mentioned that it is creative and it's very insightful for those who use it. It stretches your thinking, you know, so it, it involves a lot mm -hmm. of what ifs, and I think that can be very interesting. It opens up your mind to all sorts of alternative possibilities for the future. It doesn't go down one track, it's multiple tracks. 
um, and it creates snapshots of the future as well. And again, when we get the students involved, the focus very much is on you know, I suppose looking at drivers of change and that's so relevant. It's relevant now more than ever. And no doubt in 50 years time, it's going to be even more, you know, it's something we're going to build on in the future. So everything from like, you know, technology, it could be economic recession um, or economic cycles, let's say. Mm -hmm. And obviously in, in the context of this environmental liability as well, the whole area of future environmental liabilities and so on. Um, I suppose the other thing about um, you know, futures thinking or scenario thinking is that, again, we're using it in an academic setting. But from an industry point of view, it's it's something that's used across a whole range of sectors. It's not limited to one sector. Everything from healthcare, medicine, pharmaceutical, sport, uh, emergency and disaster management. Again, scenario planning is used for that. Uh, Board B, I used it for f food for the food sector. Um, I know, I think Trace is going to mention about education um, and uh, how it was used previously here in the IT in Sligo, but even the OECD have used it. They developed six scenarios for, uh, they called it schooling for tomorrow. So again, it was future thinking and, and education. My own area is tourism. So again, I know it's like, for example, Scottish tourism, um, they would have used scenario planning. Uh, very effectively. I've used it myself as a case study in my classes as well. So that's just some of the background. And again, Fiona, I do have one example that if we have time later, I might go through it in terms of um, it, it's one, uh, it's, a, it's a Dr. Ian Yeoman from, he's from the University of Wellington, New Zealand, and he has a great uh, set of scenarios that he's used um, for future planning for tourism. And again, there's a sustainability kind of a link in there as well. So if we have time, I might come back to that later, Fiona, if you can, uh, you know, we'll see how it goes. But sure, Mary. Yeah. Just a little bit of the background to it. Thanks for that, because it's fascinating, like you talk about hindsight and the focus typically in business in kind of historical data. And we know that like at a, from a sustainability perspective, some of the real challenges in sustainability is to try and convince organisations to step away from that short termism and the um, desire for quick wins and kind of quarterly um, targets. And that the real challenge is to try and get them to invest and stay on course with sustainability measures that often simply don't show benefits in the short term. So I guess futures thinking plays a big role there. Um, Therese, maybe I, if I can bring you in here, because I know yeah, obviously you're involved in the world of computing and technology, which is evolving so quickly. So futures mm -hmm. thinking must be very useful in your teaching. But how did you first become involved in it? Um, thanks, Fiona. Uh, I've always been interested in technological change and the positive and negative effects of technological change, including like social and environmental implications. So as part of the fourth year in computing, we have a, a module where we look at new technologies that are just emerging from a lot of different perspectives, the good, the bad and the ugly, as one of the students said last year. Um, and as part of that, I've often done like a like Mary, a workshop using scenario planning techniques. Now, one of the inspirations for that was, um, as you mentioned, was Mary was just back in the past. I think it was around 2006, 2007. There was a, a big scenario planning, or not scenario plan, big scenario planning exercise actually for the strategic plan of IT Sligo done. And I think it was run by John Kavna. And there was a paper written as a result of that. And I would use that as an example still because there were four scenarios invented for IT Sligo at the time. Disillusioned, Deirdre, Sad, Paddy. <laughs> I can't remember the other ones. Now, I wasn't involved in this, but I just found it a great inspiration. Um, and uh, I can't remember the other, Independent Ingrid, but I think it was just before the economic crash. So it was very interesting in class to look at these scenarios after the event and say, well, did, this, did IT Sligo's strategy sort of, well, did it remain resilient? <laughs> given what's happened, you know, so that was kind of an interesting start of it. So, yeah, um, one of the things that happened at the time as well was that environmental policy was looked at. And interestingly enough, the environment was very much on the agenda at the time. And the Celtic Tiger, whenever that, that economic crash came, it actually knocked the environment off the agenda again. So it was quite interesting how time can change what, what becomes kind of dominant and what the considerations are. So, yeah. Fantastic. Thanks, Therese. And um, again, yeah, it's really interesting to to bring that in, that, that how current climates can affect our, our position on um, sustainability and climate. And I guess one thing that's encouraging now is that, you know, even in current times of pandemic, mm. climate change is still to the fore, that it seems almost that it's set for a, um, to be here to stay now, which is really reassuring mm -hmm. that hopefully we'll have more stability on this issue and kind of um, 
But, you know, there's so many sustainability themes that have cropped up even in our conversation so far. Um, I'd love to go back maybe to hear some more extracts from the piece of research that you've done. Maybe, John, I'll start with you. Is there a particular sustainability theme that resonated with you? Maybe if you'd like to share um, another piece. Thank you, Fiona. Yes, um, given my own interest in political science and given the saliency of the notion democracy at the moment, um, which was obviously in the spotlight during the recent uh, US presidential election, um, one of the themes that emerged, which will obviously underpin any policy development and significant shifts in um, population attitudes towards sustainability um, over the next 50 years or so, necessarily necessitates a discussion around the future of politics and democracies and the manner in which we, we, we represent one another's wills and preferences and how we share power. So this gave rise to the following uh, excerpt from a scenario that we generated, and I'll read it as follows. So, following a period of history characterized by techno dictatorships, there has been a reinvention of democracy. This demands a highly informed citizenship that can participate directly in governance and in the development of solutions to the many problems that have emerged. The Sligo campus of uh, ATU is now open to local communities and provides spaces where people can meet, share and exchange resources and contribute to regional governance and decision making processes via the Regional Citizens Assembly. A period of degrowth wasn't widely flagged in the early 2020s, but ATU recognised that major shifts in social and economic activity would be necessary if our region stood any chance of surviving anticipated disruption um, economically in the 20s, uh, the 2030s and beyond. Business is now centered um, around a sharing, secular and service economy and geared towards meeting basic human needs. On the Sligo ATU campus, citizens can access information and up to the minute research on issues that affect them, meet for discussions, collaborate on innovations and solve problems using the resources available in the college. Training and facilitation, communication and conflict resolution is open to all. This is to enable effective participation in local, national and international governments and to help maintain a peaceful society. Thanks for that, John. There's some really strong um, sustainability principles coming through there around obviously circular economy and that emphasis mm -hmm. on um, the importance of participation and collective governance and public value. Um, and even interesting what you touched on there, the role of education and how it might look in 2070, which we might maybe come back to a little bit later, maybe in our, our Q and A's. But Mary, um, can I invite you to maybe read an extract on a, on a sustainability theme that resonated for you um, as part of your research? Yeah. Um, I will talk about maybe the focus groups and the different types of research approaches at a later time um, during our, our talk this this afternoon. But I suppose the passage just that I probably was I, I found very interesting that came out of our of our research document. Um, it, it goes as uh, as follows. Ireland is also in recovery from a mass addiction to digital devices that cause major problems with mental and physical health. Use of social media is strictly regulated and integrated wearable devices have replaced mobile phones. While ICT has become crucial to enable the communication needed for human survival, resource shortages have meant that data storage and devices are now rationed. And again, we're thinking 2070, so if you can visualize 2070 for all of this. Higher education is now lifelong and flexible, accessible online and off and free to all. But the general shortage of devices means that online access is usually via online, sorry, local and regional digital hubs network to ensure access to the highest quality research, literature and learning materials. The campus also provides a welcome space for activities promoting physical and mental health with a major resurgence in the arts and cultural tourism to enable human connection, reflection and the exchange of ideas. The old ATU theatre is a thriving space for performance and music, and this resurgence in the arts is contributing to the reinvention of well-being necessary for human and species survival in this damaged world. So that's just 
a short passage. Thanks, Mary. Um, some really interesting ideas there about lifelong and flexible learning. And then really struck me there, the, the reinvention of well-being, I think you, you called it. But that idea um, that mental health is still such a strong um, feature in 2017 and it's still a massive problem. And that, you know, the, the crucial role, I guess, that the arts play in restoring well-being. Um, which I think might be interesting to come back to. But Therese, maybe I'll just skip to you first. And um, if is there a sustainability theme that resonated with you in your research? Could you maybe read an extract for us, please? Well, the two thing, themes really that come out of this piece that I'm going to read are uh, survival <laughs> and uh, survival in the face of adversity and biodiversity, because I think that's uh, very sustainability related and it's, um, it's well started. A series of major ecological disasters in the 2020s had led to periods of political and environmental chaos. Food and fuel shortages had been a problem since then, as global supply chains collapsed, leading to near famine conditions in many countries. Climate change also induced migration, the collapse of international tourism, and has had major ramifications for agriculture with a massive reduction in meat consumption. In the ATU campus, to help address these problems, Huge domes for food production, surrounded by experiments and shelter, have replaced what used to be a running track. These enable the harvesting and marketing of a myriad number of foods never exploited or produced in our region before, as well as the staples for survival. The campus provides ground for the cultivation of fruit trees and bushes, as well as medicinal plants used for research and remedies to counter antibiotic resistance, a pressing health issue since the 2020s. The maintenance of biodiversity has become increasingly important since, since the mass extinctions of the 2040s and Sligo, building on a tradition of environmental science education since the 70s, is still a national centre of expertise. A row of beehives at the door of Yada celebrate Yeats's hive for the honey bee, and the native Irish trees planted in the 1990s to celebrate the old Irish alphabet are now well narrowed but flourishing. While there are only a few wild salmon left, the salmon sculpture at the ATU Sligo entrance, cloaked in stray apple blossoms blown from the orchard in the old car park, still signifies the value of knowledge and learning and anticipating and addressing the challenges of an uncertain future. Wow, that was very powerful, Therese, at the end. It's fantastic. I love that image of the apple blossoms and the salmon structure and that, I guess, overriding sense of hope and opportunity maybe at our feet. But unfortunately, I think the, the start of it was way too familiar to us. I know you were predicting 2070, but it sounded a little bit like 2020 with supply chains and tourism and collapsing. And, um, but yeah, you had your finger finger on the pulse there for sure. Um, I have so many questions so far, and I guess everybody else here, I'm sure they do too. But I think just before we open it up for questions, it's evident to me at least that so much as research, so much research has gone into this. It's a fascinating project. Maybe, um, Mary, can I just ask you, you, you alluded to it, to it there a minute ago, but how did you gather data for this and how did you put the project together? Well, we used a mix of, of research approaches. And again, I have to, as John said at the very beginning, this came out of a coffee, an O'Hare's conversation. So our approach was actually very relaxed and very informal, to be honest. But we did go through a research process using a mix of, of approaches. So Trace and John would have used some semi-structured interviews um, that they conducted with colleagues, um, you know, just other staff members as well as students. And they also use some class based um, scenario planning workshops as well. We would have used uh, the, uh, Trace and John would have used those as well. Um, and they'd built up some data from that. And then uh, my own work would have involved more so focus groups. So I would have conducted um, a focus, one particular focus group. It was in May 2019 and it was a group of uh, really a, a uh, students from a range of disciplines in business and social sciences, that particular faculty, and it lasted about two hours and it was quite informal, but it was it was actually a brilliant exercise because really all I was there to do was to facilitate them. I had, a, you know, about maybe eight questions or themes just to prompt them and they did the talking and what came out of the conversation was just incredible. I mean, there was a whole range. I, I just was trying to pull out the key, like the changing profile profile of the learner. And again, that's where the I, I took that passage on mental health and well-being that came out of, you know, the whole profile of the of the learner. And again, the area of diversity was very strong as well. 
the future skills and competencies of the graduates as well. Again, they talked a lot about that and they were very interested in what, what you know, what would the graduates from 50 years hence, what what would they look like? Um, again, obviously, uh, it's been mentioned here already, ICT, digital transformation, very strong coming through as well, and talk about data analytics, all of those types and how that might evolve. Um, and again, they talked about programs and research and, you know, industry led, you know, how we would work more closely with industry, both in terms of our programs, our program design, research and so on. And again, the design, the redesign of programs, postgrads, hybrid programs, all of that. There was lots of discussion and debate and ag agreements and disagreements really in that area. And just I suppose these practical modules as well and how they would evolve. Again, what was nice to, and I mean, it's it's ironic that today we sit one year later uh, with our pandemic, mm -hmm. but they actually, the role and the values of the physical campus was a major discussion point among them and just the importance of human interactions. Um, and even when mm. I was going back through my notes, this came through at, at several times during, during that discussion. Um, so again, just so relevant as of today, the 12th of March, one year later, um, mm -hmm. the importance of induction internships gap year again they all wanted to talk about that too and again go back to the industry engagement important but also the the role of community and international connections as well came through too and just the final thing i suppose just again they did mention as well and again some of them were business students that were involved but the area the role of leadership and leadership of it again i think trace has already mentioned it and and also what is unique about sligo and you know, again, the sustainability of Sligo in 50 mm -hmm. years time and, and that role, that the dominance of that role as well, and how important that role could be into the future. So that's just, that'll just give you a little bit of an idea and the themes that came out of the discussions. Thanks, Barry. Thanks so much for that, because it's true Like context is so important in sustainability and um, particularly how we prepare as a region and the role, I guess, that the IT has in that. But at this point, maybe we might like to open it up to questions if anybody would like to um, Share comments or questions within the group. I have plenty that I can um, hit you with, if not. Oh, Francis. No, I just take some pressure off the chair. <laughs> <laughs> I prepared questions there. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just interested in the in the you know thinking about our geographical location. Um, and John's opening remarks about about the um, you know the the real environment and 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 how you know that can be seen as a threat, but there are also um, there also there's also great value in being right here on the on the edge of Europe. You know, there are some remarkable advantages that we may have that, that others won't have. Um, whether you're talking about uh, environmental impacts or whether you're talking about, you know, well, I, when I say environmental impacts, I mean anthropogenic environmental impacts. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's it, it's we are in the future, you know, and that's that's the thing. You know, some of us I've, I've already been in IT Sligo for um, almost 29 years, you know, that's um, that's a considerable, that's more than a generation. As ecologists, we consider generations to be 20 years. So it's a generation and a half. And I see huge, huge changes. Um, and I think I, I really like this concept of taking a jump and thinking about where we will be, because otherwise we just tend as Irish people to just kind of flow into the future. But um, I think COVID has given us a lot of opportunities and the changes in climate to make us really think about, mm -hmm. you know, to be to be strategic about our change and what we can do for ourselves and our and our society here and the environment, of course. So sorry, just a bit of random thinking. No, that's a really good point, Francis. And I think it's also COVID has also exposed our vulnerability. You know, for so long, we've been talking about climate crisis mm -hmm. and vulnerability in supply chain and vulnerabilities across the board. And I think as a society, sometimes we feel invincible. <clears throat> and if we can be brought to our knees by a, mm -hmm. a tiny virus, you know, um, and climate change is, is the big wave coming behind that. Um, I think it's, it's very true. There's some other questions here. Um, um, Brian, can I bring you in? Hi, thanks. Uh, 
Thanks, thanks, Fiona. It's, okay. it's me you want, is it? Not, not, yes, not sorry, Brent. Yes. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, just uh, very. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting topic. It's something I obviously I'm involved with as well. I'm teaching uh, environmental engineering to level eights, and we look at um, energy, particularly and the mm -hmm. global energy and the impact of global energy on uh, the economy and on on the communities and the impact that it has on the environment, particularly uh, public health. Um, and we would look then at renewables and sustainable energies. And, and part as part of that, what we've been doing with the students is actually looking at the two different um, futures, I suppose you could look at as, as in terms of the sustainable development strategy, uh, which mm -hmm. the, uh, the Paris uh, COP21 agreement is, is aligned to. And we've also looked at the state, uh, the current policies um, strategies that are being developed around the world or currently uh, proposed for the next 20, 30 years. So looking particularly at two dates, 2030 and 2050. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see the disparity between the different strategies in terms of what we're currently doing or even what we're proposing to do around the world, particularly in not just in the EU, but in other countries and other parts of the world, other regions and the amount of growth um, that's still Propose the growth in consumer activity, the growth in GDP that we are hoping to have, particularly in some of the advancing countries, as they're called, like China and India, and then some of the work that's been done, of course, in terms of sustainable uh, energy and trying to replace the fossil fuel um, that we've, we're addicted to at the moment. You know, we've yeah. effectively been addicted for the last hundred years in fossil fuels and using yeah. fossil fuels for everything, and we have to get away from that addiction. Mm. Um, and the only way of doing that is actually to take action uh, now. So I would look at what we do in this next decade is going to influence what happens in 2050 or 2070. Um, we can't determine what what uh, the planet or even ice Sligo is going to look like in 2070. I mean, I know I have some great pitch, uh, visions of walking through Sligo IT, but we'd be going through it in boats, uh, in a boat, basically, um, if the future, because we're, there, there's the current predictions on the current policies are for a metre and a half sea rise by by 21, uh, by, by the end of the, mm. of the of the of the decade or the end of the century. And certainly uh, over half a metre uh, by that time, uh, even uh, so we don't change the way that we consume and that we utilise resources, particularly uh, fossil fuels and reduce our carbon emissions then we won't we won't be you won't be in this campus would we'll be underwater you know <laughs> so i think one of the things i would be concerned with would be that it was stated in the uh, in, uh, international energy authority I don't know if you heard of the organization they've done some quite good analysis uh, of the future and they do have mm -hmm. predicted scenarios so it's really a scenario analysis and uh, they stated that um in you know if you look at those two different scenarios those different strategies um effectively we're moving towards a scenario where we won't meet the, the paris agreements obviously under the current mm -hmm. policy we have to move towards that so they have predicted how that will change and it's really important that we've looked at policy for 10 years now about 10 years we've seriously looked at policies and how we change that and there's been a lot of agreements the decade of actually taking action is the 2020s 